Good morning, Flutterbys. It's morning here. Uh, it's Butterfly. How are you? So I'm having my morning java. Yes. Coffee is the way I start the day. Mm hmm And then it's tea for the rest of it. Okay, so I've done my co my token sort of drink of the day. So it's it's all it's all part of the what do they call it? Brand branding? Butterfly magic with hot tea. Eh. I got lukewarm coffee. Okay, we're done. <laughs> we're done with the branding. That's as good as it gets. <laughs> anyway, whatever. <clears throat> I wanted to talk today about um, energetic ties. Energetic ties. And um, I'm just, I'm really kind of just going off the cuff. Um, and if it really ends up being a bit of a mulch, maybe I'll take some notes and do a different attempt. But I'm going to speak from the heart and uh, see how that works. Um, energetic ties, I find a lot, uh, for me, spirituality and psychology are uh, closely meshed. They're very enmeshed together for me. So when I'm talking about energetic ties, I'm also talking about your psychological sort of and your social um, ties to people and uh, places and things that are around you and that you with which we interact every day. Um, I can speak at length about depression because I have had that for years. Uh, however, I must say that I would be in, I guess, what would be called remission, or I've been, for the most part, asymptomatic for about 10 to 15 years or more. Life did get better once I started taking medication. Um, but also, there's just a ton of other sort of um, exercises, cognitive and behavioral and emotional exercises, and spiritual, I would argue, that um, help to to manage the symptoms of depression. Um, and I know I'm not alone uh, in this because it's a very pervasive uh, condition in our society. And I think what buffers me is that I still take my, uh, one, one pill every day. And that kind of buffers me probably against a lot of things that uh, most people have to deal with if they're not um, taking it at all. So I'm going to preface what I'm saying by, you know, sharing that because as I'm sharing some of the skills and techniques that I, that I've been using on my own, I also have an underlining sort of a, a buffer, which brings my biochemical resilience, uh, my neurochemical resilience uh, to, you know, for me, a good level. Okay. So you might want to kind of keep that in mind. If you try some of these things and say, you know, I'm just not getting anywhere. I'm not getting any traction with this. Um, these are things that you might want to use in addition to kind of clinical professional um, expertise. Although um, going to the spiritual sort of um, techniques might also help as well before you even go to maybe, you know, if it's enough, then that's good. Okay. So talking about um, the energetic ties that you have with people that can cause depression, uh, sometimes out of the goodness of our heart, sometimes out of the kindness, out of the shoulds and should nots that we learn as very young people we carry into our adult lives, we think that there is a uh, template of fairness by which everybody plays. And when that is shattered, that template is shattered, you discover that other people are not playing by the same game, or they have ways of rationalizing what they think is fair and what you think is fair is two different things. Uh, that can cause like s feelings of sadness and, and uh, resentment and um, inadequacy, a feeling of inadequacy. You know, you keep on trying things and it still doesn't work. And that kind of... Uh, can give you a feeling of depression, of sadness, of, of low mood, when everything it just seems so uphill, right? Um, those energetic ties are, I'm going to talk about the relationships, relationships, okay? Because there's all kinds of energetic ties that you have to people's places and things. But with those relationships to so the people who are close to you, um, be they family or friends or co-workers, 
uh, we can get that feeling of unfairness and we can get that feeling of um, you just don't, you know, anything you say and do is just not good enough and you'll never get it right. So I'm going to speak to that. And um, the thing is, is that maybe you are getting it right and maybe the responses are not okay. Maybe the responses that you're getting from other people are just very judgmental and critical. Don't forget that when, when you come across as somebody who um, is taking a, people read each other. And when you project that you are feeling not good enough or that you're tiptoeing or walking on eggshells or just always trying to please other people, um, and you, and you feel inadequate, that comes across uh, to other people. And some people don't play by the same rules as you do. And there are predators. There are angry people. There are people who are just not having a good day. There are all, all kinds of people who, you know, will, will throw darts because it's easy to do it. And you won't fight back. Um... That puts, that, that is, you know, something that can really make you feel like, mm, mm, and that builds resentment. And then you get the feeling of wanting to fight back. And so you overcompensate and that's a problem because now you're also being an aggressor. They might've been in your shoes at that point, right? Not so long ago. Then they come across as an aggressor to you when they're feeling justified in their own feelings of inadequacy, right? We know that bullies do feel inadequate. It's very easy to come from a feeling of inadequacy and then overcompensate with your anger, but it's not going to elicit the, the kind of response from other people that you want. It just ends up playing by the same rules as other people. And, and, uh, and then it gets to be kind of like a dog eat dog. Uh, I'll get them before they get me. Okay, so those are the kind of energetic ties. And uh, what I'm going to talk about all energetic ties in one video? No, <laughs> this is the one specific one that I'm talking about for for now for this moment. Is that uh, feeling of inadequacy, that overcompensation, um, and how that can lead to depression, and how what you're seeing as really mean in other people can also happen with ourselves. Right. Okay. But what do you do with that? That's the next part is what do you do with that feeling of inadequacy? Um, well, for the most part, the most obvious place to go to is to kind of talk it over with a friend. Friends can be biased. Hopefully they are biased because they'll be in your court. That's what friends are for. Uh, I would say the number one place to go actually is to a psychotherapist or a counselor of sorts who's actually certified, qualified in some way to be able to kind of reflect back and give you some feedback and to help you to grow um, and to be objective because friends are subjective. Counselors can be objective. Um, at least they're trained to be objective, right? So that's a resource. The other thing is, of course, uh, medication, right? Some people have lots of thoughts and feelings around medication, whether you want to do it long term, short term, or not at all, that sort of thing. I'm just throwing it out there. It's something to consider. There are some spiritual practices that I'm going to talk about here that have helped me. And so I'm going to share that with you uh, because I have been in those situations. And I remember quite long ago, uh, victims tend to be victimized. And if I was walking around with a very victim sense, um, it would really attract people who, who wanted to take advantage. And then it sort of proved that I was inadequate to myself because, you know, if more people are coming at me and throwing darts at me and, you know, pooping on me because they're having a bad day as they're passing by and whatever, and not giving me a second thought, then I would absorb all that as good empath does, right? So that really, really um, set me up for depression years ago. Um, and I know that that's something that goes on today because we do have a lot of really good people, a lot of really good people who are trying to be, be very kind and who are not receiving that kindness back. And so that ends up 
um, we get into all kinds of maladaptive behaviors like um, addiction and uh, self-deprecation where you're saying nasty things about yourself, you know, you're thinking nasty things about yourself. It gets into a lot of maladaptive behavior when you're absorbing all that negativity and that nastiness from other people. And the more you wear that coat, that energetic coat of I'm not good enough, the more people who are, you know, want to throw darts to anybody who will receive them. They're, re they're throwing darts at everybody, by the way, even the people who don't receive them. You just happen to be absorbing them. At least that was my experience. So then you, then I would go back home and sort of think about my day and wonder, oh God, what an awful day. And then you focus on, or I used to focus on, this is a very depressive way of thinking, is to focus on the negative things that happen uh, throughout the day and kind of absorb it into your identity, absorb it into your energetic coat that you wear, all those layers of nastiness that you wear. And so what I'm suggesting is that with some spiritual techniques, you can kind of peel off those layers of onions and pe peel off that those layers of negativity and realize that just because people are, even if lots of people are being mean to you, it doesn't mean that you deserve that, right? And so the more you think, oh, I deserve this and it's not fair. So I know I don't deserve this. And yet it keeps on happening and the world is unfair and grumble, grumble, grumble. And so you were, it becomes toxic, it becomes poisonous, right? And so we need to share, shed those energetic layers of, of nastiness that we get throughout the day and to be aware that that is actually happening. Um, some of the layers of awareness some of the, I'll just say layers of awareness, because I can't quite think of it, stages of awareness, depths of awareness that you have. You could be aware and take account of things at the end of the day, either by writing them down or by just taking a moment to contemplate, okay, this happened, this happened, this happened, and I could have, should have, would have said that, or it's not fair when they said that. And you're thinking about all these things at the end of the day. That's one, one sort of stage of awareness. As you actually um, become more introspective and try and be objective about the experiences that you have, and diplomatically sort of like dissect these experiences throughout the day to find the similarities and what you can do differently, um, you may end up getting to the stage where you can recognize right in the moment, not at the end of the day, or cumulatively at the end of the week, but right in the moment when somebody is being really nasty to you and address it appropriately, not by yelling back, but by appropriately addressing it and calling out to attention, describing what it is that, that they're saying or doing to you and how you, that, you know, how you're feeling as a response in the moment. That's a very uh, real stage of awareness or quality and awareness that that you have to kind of work up to because then you're dealing with things as they're happening and you don't have to carry it with you like baggage uh that is kind of like it's called being assertive not aggressive but assertive and it's just more an adaptive way of working with uh, people and the stressors that happen in life and and that's something that a counselor can help you strategize around um, when I'm watching the news, I watch a lot of the, the, the news and, oh gosh, there's such negative things around in the news, eh? right? Um, and I remember, what was it called? The incels, incels here in Canada, in Toronto, actually, <clears throat> uh, I won't bother saying his name, but there was just a few years ago. So now we're in 2021. This was pre-COVID. So I don't know, maybe about three years ago. You look it up in Toronto. There was a white van that um, that went and uh, basically hit a bunch of people intentionally hit with the van. He rented a van for the day and, and he was trying to die by suicide. And uh, with the smart cop that actually got him in the end, um, didn't shoot. And so he's alive and he's doing time. But those people died. And the, 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 the connection that I'm making to this particular case is that he, he and um, other people who are in this kind of belief system of being an incel, an involuntary celibate, is that um, 
is that there's so much resentment that builds up over time. Uh, and he likely didn't, you know, cleanse it regularly that, uh, it, it ended up becoming, um, his identity. And then he takes it out on the rest of the world. And we see this also with people who, um, you know, go into a school and shoot their colleagues. We hear about these cases or who take out aggression on large groups of people. And there's multiple examples of that in the news. Um, and I, and I wonder if, if they would take the time to sort of just say to themselves on a daily basis, you know, this is how I'm going to cleanse energetically. This is how I'm going to just take a moment and say, okay, reality check. Um, how can I make the world a better place? Um, how can I become more peaceful within myself? How can I take off these layers of pain and shed them in a healthy way, in an adaptive way? How can I do that and center myself and ground myself? Um, I, I, I would argue that if people who perpetrate violence and, and anger um, as their first line of defense, um, who make it their mission to harm other people, I think that they probably aren't taking that time to sort of meditate and re reflect. And I would argue that perhaps um, centering and grounding and learning these techniques of, of, of um, becoming more peaceful and looking at how you can make the world a better place, not through violence, but through, through kindness. Um, and if they did that, perhaps they wouldn't be um, looking to kill other people and then, and then dying themselves. Um, because really, if you're going to die at the end of the day, what does it matter if other people die first? Your level of satisfaction is very short lived. So it seems like a moot point. It's, there's some reflection there that hasn't quite happened. They haven't thought it quite through. At any rate, I'm saying that um, for me, being happier uh, has been about letting go of, you know, the feelings that I carried when people were really not very nice. Uh, when when predators came about. Now, I'm not saying that it was okay for people to be mean or to do, you know, mean things. Uh, and I'm also not saying that I even forgive people who have not been accountable for the things that they've done. Uh, because forgiveness is a different thing. But I'm saying that removing those layers of negative energy that I carry and the thoughts that I've carried and how I let it affect me and the resilience that I've built as a result, um, that matters. That's a very important practice that I think uh, we as people would benefit from on a regular basis. So I'm going to leave you with some um, exercises, some thoughts that I have on how to do that. Uh, yes, I could recommend all kinds of energy related books, all kinds of self help books. I love books, but I find sometimes when my mind is so busy, um, I don't want to sit down and focus on words and reading because it requires too much energy and just no, <laughs> I just don't want to. So there's things that I like to do with my hands and what I do is I I really engage my senses, my senses of sight, of smell, of taste, of hearing, and the vibration too with drum. Okay, so as I'm talking about drum, I'll go to this first. Well, I am fortunate enough, enough to live in Canada, and I have um, really a great number of communities of Indigenous folk around me, um, and I consult with them. Um, and um, life is just really good in that way here. So wherever you are in the world, perhaps you have people who are indigenous to that land. Um, and in doing so, perhaps you can ask questions and uh, be invited or ask to attend a ceremony, uh, drumming, um, healing circles, um, always go by. When you're walking in, it's 
their rules and their ways. Um, my experience is that Indigenous folk are very, very inviting and very kind, very passive. So if you're doing something that is energetically very unkind, uh, you probably won't be met with unkindness in return. Uh, and that's a very important, important uh, lesson. Um, because people are passive doesn't mean that to continue being unkind towards them, which which has been done historically in this land. But anyways, that's my digress. So um, we've met on my channel before Winnie, and she helped me to, she taught me to make my three drums, uh, one for myself and one for my two children. And this is the one that I use most, and we tie some uh, tobacco, some sema on the back, and I've made my, my drumstick. And so much more regularly now I am drumming, much more regularly. Uh, before COVID, I was going at least once a week to um, this, this place uh, where she would do meditation some days of the week. She would do drumming one day of the week. She would do all kinds of different things there. Um, but with COVID, lots of places closed. This was a very grassroots sort of by donation kind of a place and rent could no longer be paid. And so we, it's closed now. We can't go there. So I'm, you know, actively trying to find other places to go that some of them haven't even reopened yet. Ironically, um, recently in the last few months, I've have another part-time job. So two part-time jobs working in addictions and, um, I, they, they go smudge. They go smudge. It's not an indigenous kind of a, uh, place to work, but they have, um, uh, facility where uh, the people there like to go and smudge. And so I um, have associated smudging with drumming. And so I have brought my drum and I've been teaching songs uh, to to the people who are there. And it's, it's kind of catching and it's kind of becoming a thing. So instead of looking for um, places to go, I've kind of cr started creating a place of my own. So um, that's kind of cool right now in this moment. Anyway, so here's my drum. And I won't go through a lot of different things, but if you do have questions, please do ask them in the comments down below, and I will speak at length about, um, you know, my experience with drumming and how it actually helps me to deal with depression. Sometimes just drumming helps, and I'll sometimes put a video on, like a music video, and drum along with them. Uh, and sometimes I have songs that I, I will practice and I will sing on my own as well. So drumming is really important. You don't have to be, um, like, don't go and buy these things ready made on Amazon. Um, go, go to the source. This is, this is my own, I'm telling you, um, somebody who is local and who is indigenous and who can teach you how to respect the grandmother drum and, and um, give you teachings about that. It, that's, that's my recommendation. Okay. So that's one way for me that I deal with anxiety. That's one way that I cleanse those energetic strands uh, that happen throughout the day. And for me, it really works because there's something very powerful about the percussion and how it immediately affects I feel it in my, in my core. I feel it in my mind. It puts me in a different state, a different trance, a different, it resets my clock mentally. And that's a cleansing thing. It's the most powerful thing to me. Now, something that I've been doing at my altar space, at my prayer space, my altar space, um, is also using sound. Now, when I go to, and that cleanses and that resets as well, it's very, very simple. If you don't have time, if you don't have access to the drum, you can make your own. I am telling you, um, with these kind of drum circles that I am partaking in, um, I am providing uh, shakers. I keep on wanting to call them rattles, like baby rattles, but they're shakers. And they're very easy to make. So if you don't have access to something like a turtle shell, don't go hunting turtles and killing them. But I mean, when you have people who live off the land, they will use what is available. I don't have any turtle shells. I don't. I don't fill them with, you know, whatever. I don't have turtle shells. At least not yet. Um, and I won't be going to buy any. I mean, if it's gifted to me by an elder, that's different. But um, 
I've shown these before. These are water bottles. And so I have two of these. I have four of these. These are maracas. Okay. And I also have these, which are filled with bells. I made these for daycare when I used to work in daycare for 16 years. Um, I'm going to be making some smaller ones. They're basically just balloons and uh, I think a, a large um, straw. Uh, balloons that have been paper mache and then straw and then decorated and then it's just white glue. There's nothing sexy about it and the paint comes off after years of use. So uh, I'm going to be making some smaller ones of those. Um, and what I'm finding is that they're very loud. So when you're in a larger group and you want to kind of really kind of, you know, sing, uh, I pass those around and they're, and they're loud. Uh, in a smaller space like this, in my altar space, I might not want to have something so jarring, so so loud when I'm cleansing my own space. Um, so make your own um, toilet paper roll. Um, wrap it in whatever gauze, blue paper mache. You know, look up something that works for you, and that will make a rattle if you fill it with lentils or beans or rice or something to make a shaker and because it's not a plastic container because it's paper it'll give a softer sound it won't be as jarring and it'll be softer sounding so i'm in the process of making some of those so maybe if i think of it and when it's done then i'll be able to show you you know it's really very easy you don't have to pour money into manufacturers to do stuff that's spiritually cleansing and that's healthy okay um, another way that you can cleanse things energetically is by using sage. I haven't put any here. I do grow sage, um, and somewhere in, in teachings as well. If you kind of go to it, you're not, you know, you don't want to kind of buy from, from manufacturers who like grow a lot of sage. Um, but then growing your own may or may not fall into your belief system of, you know, what's ethical or what's environmentally friendly or whatever. But Anyway, sage, if you grow it, kind of like, if you find it, that's kind of like the ultimate good thing when you find sage. But sometimes it's really hard to find sage because it's been picked over, walked over, eaten. Um, and so there are some beliefs around or some ethical issues around farming sage. If you farm it, you can grow it in your backyard. If you grow it, you know, is that authentic or not? Anyways, look. At the end of the day, I could argue all kinds of stuff and you can't fit into everybody's belief system. So with regard to sage, I do grow my own. Sometimes I'm gifted sage. Sometimes I buy it from uh, people who grow it, who are, who, who get it from the land. Um, sage. Sage can be very cleansing. No, this is not an eagle feather. Uh, if I went around looking for eagle feathers, I mean, I have a couple that have been gifted to me. But for the most part, I have about a billion just pigeon and goose feathers and duck feathers and whatever feathers fall from or in my environment. And that's what I use for the most part. Raven, a lot of raven feathers. And so I will sage. And so I sage all the, um, all the, there's a way of saging. And if you're interested in that, just, uh, you know, I, you can ask me in the comments down below and I will share with you what I have learned about Sage. And um, yeah, if you're interested, I can share that with you. And everybody probably has their different ways. Now, this Nag Champa, love it. I have it burning back here. Uh, I am pretty eclectic in the things that I do and that's why I can have my mom and my dad's Mother Cabrini, which I grew up with these two gals here, each on their own dresser, <laughs> my mom's dresser and my dad's dresser. Uh, I can have Buddha. I can have Archangel, Michael, I have this one also. My gal here, Mary, and Grover, and butterfly puzzles, <laughs> and fairies. I'm very eclectic. Oh, and dragons up there, and angels. Yeah, this is my space, and there's pentacles, and there's mandalas, and there's, oh, and mala beads. You know, so, look, and indigenous drums, and Mexican maracas. I mean, baby, I, if it works, I do it. So, uh, if that either means I'm inclusive or, cultural, or culturally appropriating, I don't know. 
I, I'm not into labeling, but anyways, incense, Nag Champa. I love it. Uh, it takes me into the zone and it helps me to cleanse energetically. So that's one thing. These, these I got, uh, when I was living in Thunder Bay, uh, once upon a time at a store called the Black Unicorn, which was a very metaphysical store where I bought my first introductions to everything. This is called Accuspheres, health balls, date back to 1368 to 1644 from the Ming Dynasty. There's a little write-up that goes with it. I'm not going to read it, but I will show it to you. There you go. Voila. Hopefully that, uh, I don't know, floats your boat. So this is one way where I can... I'll use a carry it down here. It's easier down here. So with the acuballs, um, it touches different acupressure points and kind of is a way of energetically cleansing. Or you can do one on each side. You can rattle them and do it in reverse. The other hand, you can do it both ways. So there's different things that you can do with an acuball. This is the first pendulum I ever bought, and I keep that in there as well. Um, cleansing energetic space for me, uh, does include a lot of sound, but you do see with smell with the sage and the, uh, and the incense. We're going back into sound though, just for a moment. Um, I had a few of these. You hear the sound. So. And you can feel that. I can feel that in my in my soul, in my heart. Um, Learning to do that without rubbing it the wrong way is also a very mindful practice. And when you're focusing on a thing intensely, um, that's one way of clearing your energetic strands, your your energetic sort of links and ties. It cleanses, it cleanses you. It really does. And I'm sure physicists all around the world have ways of plugging into the brain and measuring things, like uh, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza, who writes about uh, these things that are happening in your brain with all these healing and mindful exercises um but i just know it works because in my subjective experience i feel it and if i feel better then the next day uh you know the next moment i will be able to better deal with the people who are giving me responses that i don't have to absorb i don't have to absorb i mean visualizing uh that kind of that silver bubble or that protective bubble around you is one way where you can just kind of watch their words bounce and bounce off. If that, if visualization works for you, that's another great technique you can use. Um, the bell is something that we use. A lot of people will use around their altar space to cleanse um, with sound. And it can also cleanse your altar, your, your being, your person is your, your own temple, your own altar. Um, so saying this, oh, and this is something else. This is a, a relatively new acquisition for me. I got it for my birthday last year. So that was in November and we're here in September. So it's been almost a year and I've been using this really well. Um, I don't find my Athame is, I mean, I don't, I mean, I know I can point it and traditionally kind of point it to the quarters and do all these things and drawing circles when I'm you know, doing circle. Doing circle for me um, when I'm witching is, is a little bit of a challenge just because of the space that I have. Um, this very small room is dedicated to my spiritual space and I don't have a lot of room to sort of walk around and dedicate space. And I don't go outside to do a lot of ritual because a lot of times when I'm doing my spiritual stuff, it's just like sit and do it for five minutes. I don't have time to like drive someplace out in the wilderness. I don't always have time for that. And I don't always want to make the time for that. Um, so my Athame, what I've been using it mostly for is, and this is just a fancy, sexy little, uh, you know, uh, 
letter opener. I think it's like 13 inches and it was like $13 on, um, I made a video about it. I, I don't even remember. Did I buy it on Amazon? I don't even know where I bought it, but I bought it online and I'm intensely in love with it because it helps me to cleanse those strands. I've actually, especially I find that I, I, I pick up stress and tension on the back of my neck. You no. Know? And so I cut, I visually, like I, I cut those strands and then, well, not this candle, but we use like when I'm at my altar, I, I let out my, my four candles here. Um, I let out my four candles for the cardinal directions. So for me, this is south facing because it works in this room right now, south facing. So my Way. So here's my yellow one, here's my red one for south, and my west for uh, blue, and my green for north, because north would be kind of that way. And um, my Mother Mary's on my left side because that's west is this way. And uh, Archangel Michael is kind of left, so that's kind of like you know, on the left side of your altar is sort of male, although male and female is kind of interchangeable with me. And even though my gals here are female and they're on the left, it's more because it's past. <laughs> past is left for me. And so that's my mom and my dad. And it's my, my childhood. All my childhood stuff is on that side. Anyways, everything here is kind of symbolic and it looks like a lot of tchotchke, but there's there's logic behind it. I call it rationalization. It works. So anyway, all that to say, these are the candles I like. And when I'm cutting out those energetic strands that I don't like, I don't find serve me. Um, I pass it over the um, the flames. I should talk this way because I've found in videos when I talk in the other direction, it doesn't pick up as well. So I hope I hope I haven't done too much of that. Anyways, I pass the the athame over the flame without burning my my blade because I'm a bit of a geek and I want to keep it unscathed for now. Uh, and it, it burns the, I picture it like spider webs, burning spider webs. That's kind of what I picture. So I go around my chakras and then I, I burn off the spider webs of energy of people. And I'm thinking about all the things, especially when there's like, why the heck did that person do that to me? You know? And, uh, that helps to cleanse me mentally which makes for a much healthier person. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'll put it back the way I normally do because I'm backwards and this is not. There we go. I'm just gonna put her there. Okay, I think that's pretty much everything. Oh, and this. This is more of a mindfulness ex um, exercise. I do have some fidget spinners. On my altar space, I do have fidget spinners on my altar space, and um, this is a very meditative mindfulness practice. If you don't do anything else, um, this is helpful, and you can just focus on the fidget spinner, and it's a mindfulness sort of brings you down to just thinking about one thing, one thing, thinking about its pain. When it's done, then you can spin it again. That is one way of kind of centering yourself, grounding yourself, and kind of cleansing away all the nastiness that happens in a day. So there's a few techniques for you and kind of the rationale behind it. Um, I really find it's important to kind of uh, let that stuff go. Let that stuff go. And it does not mean that you have to forgive somebody. I think forgiveness is an entirely different thing. There's just like this newness about forgiveness and stuff. Um, I think uh, you don't need to forgive somebody to not carry resentment. Um, I think forgiving somebody requires some accountability. And so I would argue that if the person's not accountable, i.e. maybe they've died and they can't be accountable, you can imagine, I would imagine them being accountable after they've died, whether they are or they're not. I don't know if that's even possible, but I believe it's possible. Um, but for the living, I think uh, that there has to be a sense of responsibility for forgiveness, uh, because otherwise, like I'll give an example. 
there's this person uh, who I've known my whole life because I'm related to her. <laughs> and um, there's like zero accountability. Zero. Like she's just not able to be. She's just, it's it's not part of her psyche. It was not part of her childhood development. It's not been something she's looked for. Um, it's just everybody else has a fault. Um, and certainly I'm, yeah, just it's it's mind-boggling really there's like zero lack of accountability constantly so for me to kind of put myself in her space is basically saying well do i forgive her well i understand her lack of emotional maturity um i can appreciate that she has not learned to be accountable and that it does not take away from who she is as a person in fact it's a you know a, a way of spiritually and mentally and psychologically growing when you can be accountable for something and move forward and try not to do that again she's just not able to she's just not able to so can i forgive her when she can't even acknowledge that there's a thing um but I let go of the resentment. And I also don't put myself in a position where I have to be around her for very long because I know that sure enough, um, she's going to throw darts. She's going to throw shade. She's going to throw, you know, all these things. And if I then take that in and start grumbling about it and then resent, I, I get resentful because it's like, geez, she can't be accountable. And if I try to address it with with her, it's just not going to happen. It just ain't going to happen. There ain't no, there's no, there's no thread of logic. Okay. There's just none. It's don't look for it. Don't try another thing because it's not there. So, um, so I have to limit my time with that person and, um, yeah, she's older now and yeah, she might die tomorrow and yeah, she might die in 10 years and yeah, she'll die at some point. But does that mean I have to subject myself to feeling obligated to spending time with this person for long periods of time when I know that I'm going to walk away feeling not energized? I'm going to feel depleted. I'm going to feel subjugated. I'm going to feel depressed. I'm going to feel like something's been taken. I'm going to feel like I'm putting my banging my head against the wall. It's no longer an issue of forgiveness. It's an, it feels like I'm putting myself into a vat of rotating blades intentionally by putting myself with this person and of course because it's a part of the family it's part of the, like your relations um there's that feeling of obligation to show up and make nice nice so um if this person if you know if two people had not had sex at some point in history to create the family relations if this person was just not part of my family any reasonable advice would be if you feel that crappy around her don't go around her but because there's those family ties and because somebody had sex somewhere in history there's like social obligations to show up and make merry and not address issues because when you're in family situations you cannot address issues because it's not time for therapy right and so there's never really any good time to talk about it. And even if you do talk about it on a one-on-one, -on -one, there's, there's no accountability. So does that then become a matter of forgiveness? You know, sometimes I'm forgiving her a good swift kick in the, you know, but it's, it's just not going to do anybody any good. So um, that's when techniques like this can be really useful. You know, because sometimes you have to put yourself in situations like in a workplace where somebody is there and who just kind of gnaws your craw. And maybe your craw does not like to be gnawed, you know, for eight hours a day at work or whatever. Um, and so you need to find some ways to sort of cleanse those and bring yourself back to ground zero. Bring yourself back to, uh, you know, reset your clock. So that's why these things are really, really important. And I would also suggest if these things um, don't help to then look towards other mindfulness practices like hobbies. We have really let go of hobbies in our society. It used to be at one time that everybody either played an instrument of some kind, whether it was the spoons or the piano or anything in between, where that is very mindful practice to to practice for an hour a day for 20 minutes a day for four hours a day depending on how your level of skill um where you'd focus on something to get better and just take time by yourself you know 
sewing, um, cross stitching, knitting, uh, any kind of those crafting things where you, you know, painting little statues, um, painting rocks, uh, mindful practices where you're walking back and forth mindfully, um, like some Buddhist monks will do, you're walking back and forth mindfully. There's a lot of hobbies that, that are really productive that bring your mind into the zone of focusing on a thing and are peaceful for your brain to, to do. Uh, because what we spend a lot of time doing right now is spending it in front of the computer where we're just absorbing information and it kind of gives you that dopamine hit constantly, constantly, you know, small sound bites like TikTok and one minute this, and one minute that, where you get a jolt and a jolt and a jolt. And then we wonder why we see so much attention deficit and we wonder why we, we feel so bombarded with, you know, and so like, but it's addictive because you get that dopamine hit with every minute of new information you get. You can't focus on long stories. You can't focus on long periods of time doing a hobby and completing a thing. Why? Because we're trained to just get bombarded with more and more and more. And it's an addiction. It really is. So the more I understand that, the more I realize um, I want to kind of come away from that. I don't want to respond immediately to every cell bell, <laughs> cell phone bell, or every alert or notification that comes up. Uh, because that too really kind of gets you into, oh, a new thing, a new thing, a new thing. And, and it gets you away from focusing on mindfulness practices and bringing you back to being grounded. Um, so we're learning a lot of maladaptive skills in our society. Uh, and we have been for decades. And it's not, it's not really conducive to relationships. It's not really conducive to being productive. Um, it produces a lot of addiction. It does, because we have to kind of keep feeding ourselves with stimulants and then bringing ourselves down with other sort of um, downers, uh, other kind of relaxants and stuff so that we can perform and keep up with this very unnatural environment. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of like a webbing that comes out of, <laughs> from the, the core issue that I was talking about, which is energetic strands and how to kind of manage them and cleanse your cleanse yourself of those energetic ties um, on a daily, on a regular basis as much as possible. So find some kind of a mindfulness practice that works for you. And I hope this has been helpful. I'm going to tie this up now. Um, yeah, that's about it for today. Take care, onward and upward, and have a wonderful day.